Hello, we are the Gallon family from Restore Enfield. Today's reading is from the first book of Samuel and is all about a man called Elkanah, his wife Hannah and the birth of their son Samuel. Elkanah had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children but Hannah had none. Year after year this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hopni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portion of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Anna he gave a double portion, because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, the rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look at your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord, and all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As he kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of the great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favour in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that we can be together today. We ask for your blessing on Chris and everyone listening. We ask you to fill Chris with your Holy Spirit as she ministers to us. And may our heart and our ears be open to receive all you have for us today, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in our midst. And may everyone's need be met so that you can be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Chris King. Um, I haven't been around for a while, and uh, I've been wondering during this um, lockdown, well, I have been around, but just not around here. Um, welcome to my living room. We've had it done up since um, you last saw me. And um, I was just wondering, what have you been up to during lockdown? Um, I've um, become a market gardener. I thought at the beginning of the, of the time that a uh, couple of things I wanted to do. One is I've taken up golf, so I am now Chris the golfer. But the other thing is I wanted to share, especially this morning, because I'm going to be talking about supernatural fruit, fruitfulness, um, I want to share the fruit of my labour. Now, the sad thing is, because I am someone who doesn't really do gardening or anything like that, in fact, anything green, um, just don't give it to me because I'll kill it. But this is actually Tommy, Tommy the tomato. And it's so sad because um, 
not only did I grow this, this is the first fruits of my labour, not only did I grow this, but I named the first five of my tomatoes, I named them. Um, so this is Tommy and he will be lunch today. So I wonder what you guys have been up to during this time of lockdown. For some of us, it's been a really tough time, hasn't it? It's been really difficult and um, kind of day in, day out, everything being totally different. And um, this morning, we're going to be talking about someone who was living in a really tough time, a time um, when the word of God was really, really scarce and a time when for her personally, it was really, really difficult. And I kind of thought, do you know what? I can really relate to that. We're going to be thinking about Hannah. Now, earlier on, the canons acted out Samuel and what happened with Samuel. Now, Hannah was Samuel's mum. And so we're going to do a big shout out for the mums. If anybody's still listening, any of the kids are still listening, I want you to go do a really big shout out for your mum and say, yay, go mum. OK, if, you're, um, if your mum's not around or whatever, maybe you could say, go gran or go auntie or whatever you want to do. But let's cheer on the mums this morning because Hannah, in a really, really difficult situation, just held on to God and then she saw fruitfulness come out of her own very difficult situation. So the main part of the story is in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we've just had that beautifully read by the Gallum family. Thank you very much. I don't know if you noticed at the very end there when they said amen, they signed it, um, which I thought was really, really special. So thank you for that. And the story is about a guy called Elkanah. And I thought we'd look at what's in a name. I expect you've heard um, Ian and myself say many, many times that we're really into names. And so what does the name Elkanah mean? Well, it means God created. And they were of the tribe Ephraim. And Ephraim means doubly fruitful, which was slightly ironic in the situation because I'm not going to go into the ethics of this, but there, Elkanah had two wives, okay? We'll just leave it like that. There was Penina and there was Hannah. I have very much difficulty every time I say panina because I think of paninis and I'm thinking ham and cheese and I get very hungry. But panina had kids and Hannah did not. And so that was a very difficult situation for them. So although they were of the tribe of Ephraim, which should have been doubly fruitful, they both should have had fruitfulness, they didn't. And so you have panina, her name meant pearl and jewel. And then you had Hannah, and her name meant grace. And I think that's a really lovely meaning of a name. I love the name Grace. I love the name Charis, which means grace. But actually, when you're having to have grace in a difficult situation, then it's not quite so lovely. It probably doesn't feel quite so lovely. And so I don't know about you, but we haven't made it away this year. I don't know why. There's just been a lot um, happening um, and uh, we haven't been on holiday. But for those of you fortunate people who have actually made it away, maybe you've packed up the car and uh, you put bikes on the back and you put suitcases on the roof, whatever you do, and you get all your music ready and you're off in the car. And then a little way along, you hear this voice. It says... Are we nearly there yet? And usually the answer is no, we're still on the M25. But the reality is you've not gone very far at all. And I think this lockdown time, time I can't say that, lockdown time, there we go, got it. Um, this lockdown time has been a bit like that. I think we've been living in the not quite yet. Living in the not quite yet yet. You see, at the beginning of lockdown, maybe we had some great dreams. Maybe we had some ideas of, okay, you know, I mean, I know for some people it's been a, a really, really much more hectic in terms of, you know, not only have you got a job to do, but you've got kids to look after and all the things um, that, you know, everyday life is involved in, in lockdown. But for some people I know as well, at the beginning, it was there was very much a sense of, OK, God, what are you saying to us during this time? What are you saying um, to me personally? And taking that opportunity as everything in the world seemed to stop to say, OK, God, what is it? that you're saying to us right now. And some of us got hold of some stuff at the beginning, but actually 
when you're living in the not quite yet, some of that type of stuff just falls away. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't become fruitful in the way that we would want it to do. And so if we look at Hannah, how did she cope with it? She was living in a time where um, there was very little fruitfulness. It was a time when the word of the Lord was scarce. Spiritually, it was a really difficult time. But also, she was living in a place where she had no children. And that was a big, big thing for her. She was desperate to have a child. And every year, they would go to the house of God, Shiloh. Again, what's in a name? Shiloh means the place of rest. And so Hannah would go to this place of rest, to the place of God, the place of the presence of God. And isn't that the place that we need to get to when we're in a desperate place? We need to go there. But actually, it wasn't a positive experience for her. I can imagine year in, year out, just as anniversaries can be really painful when we're grieving, year in, year out, it was a reminder to her that Panina had kids and she did not. And so in verse six, verses six and seven, it says this, her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. And it happened year after year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. I don't know about you, but um, if I'm that desperate and I'm that desolate and feeling so down that I don't eat, I am really in a bad way. And so poor Hannah, she was there and she was being provoked. It was, wasn't even bad enough that she couldn't have a child, but she was being provoked by Panina. Panina was um, coming in as her rival and, and coming and having a go at her and putting her down. And you know what? When we're in a place where it, we're feeling barren, when we're in a place where things are really hard and difficult, that is a place when the enemy wants to come in and really put the nails in the coffin, really put us right down. And I'd like to suggest there are a few ways that maybe Hannah felt, and but also ways that the enemy has tried to get to us. Because the enemy is real. He's not a devil with a pitchfork. He's not a made-up thing. We have an enemy who wants to rob, kill, steal, and destroy. And he will have been in this barren place, in this place of lockdown. He will have been having a go at us and trying to take us out whatever way he can. But these are the ways that I think in particularly, certainly for me, I've found um, that the enemy's been trying to have a go at me. And I think these are the ways that maybe um, the enemy was trying to take Hannah out in this situation as she waited for that place of uh, fruitfulness, as she waited in that place of not quite yet. So the first thing is the enemy will make us feel less than others. He will make us feel overlooked. He'll make us feel a failure. I'm sure Hannah felt a failure. She couldn't have a child. That's a totally irrational thing, if you cannot have children, to feel a failure. But it's a very natural thing as the way it's expressed in terms of when the enemy's having a go. Think it doesn't have to be logical, but it's things that can really get hold of us. And we know that hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. And that can make us really feel less than who we really, really are. And the final thing is we feel misunderstood. And that's the thing that I really wanted to major on this morning, is that I think particularly in a time of lockdown, particularly when we haven't got the opportunity on the whole to see people face to face in the same way, there is such a huge opportunity for misunderstanding and we as a leadership have been very much praying over the unity in the spirit over restore because I don't know about you but I can sometimes feel I tell myself stories okay I tell myself stories that that um, someone looked at me like that therefore they are thinking this about me and and sometimes this story you know I mean it can be a whole epic can be a whole novel about what I'm thinking, the story that I'm telling myself. Um, and 
often what I'll do is I'll, I, I'll just say, let's go out for coffee with someone. And usually, to be honest, when I go out for coffee or I see them again, I kind of go, nah, that... <laughs> That story, that story is not true. That's that's not actually how it is at all. And it can put things back into perspective. But when we're in a position where, I don't know, we're communicating through Zoom calls, social media, um, maybe not communicating at all. Maybe there's people who haven't contacted you all through lockdown. And that's a really big thing for you. We can tell ourselves stories. And those stories aren't necessarily the truth. And I really think at the moment, what we need to be doing is to be praying over our unity. It says in Ephesians that we should make every effort to keep the unity through the bond of peace. We need to make every effort. So if there's somebody that you are feeling um, disgruntled with or feeling uh, a difficulty or an awkwardness in relationship with at the moment, can I really encourage you as I encourage myself, don't stay in that place. Pray and bring the hurt that you feel and say, OK, God, what can, I, what can I do about this? And bless the person. Maybe you actually need to physically bless them, send them a gift or, or do something like that. But certainly pray blessing on them over and over and over again. Because actually, that's the way that the enemy can get at us and really break us apart. We feel misunderstood and then we feel that we have a right, therefore, to feel a bit out of sorts with someone. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So what did Hannah do? Not what would Jesus do, but what did Hannah do? Well, the first thing she did was she processed her pain with God. She processed her pain with God. She brought her inner pain and she brought it into the presence of the one who could do something about it. I've been really enjoying watching some of the stuff on Right Now Media. Um, something I think we sent round very early on was um, a thing by Henry Cloud called The Psychology of Grief. And it's quite a long thing, so get a cup of tea and you know, sit down and, and watch it. But it is such a powerful thing. And I remember the very first thing that he said was acknowledge your grief. Acknowledge the difficulty. You see, we mustn't just sweep under the carpet all the stuff that we've been feeling during this lockdown. You know, British stiff upper lip and whatever it is, however much we think, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm strong and I can do this. No, we need to say the first thing is this sucks. This is rubbish. This is really difficult. I'm really struggling with that. That sort of stuff we need to acknowledge first. And then we need to offer it to Jesus. We need to offer it to God. We need, like Hannah did, to go to the place of the house of God. We, need to, we can't do that physically at the moment, but we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And we need to get into the presence of God so that we can process our grief. Please, please, please do not sweep it under the carpet because you will just trip up over that bit of carpet very, very soon, probably. And then once we've processed that grief, once we've processed the pain, once we've acknowledged it before God, then we can receive his healing. We can receive his guidance and his goodness and his love and his restoration. Can I just say as well, it got really messy. The reason Hannah was misunderstood by Eli was that she wasn't sort of there saying a nice little prayer, oh God, please give me a baby. It, he, he looked at her and thought she was drunk. It was really, really messy. And sometimes we just need to splurge and let God know how it really, really feels. If you don't think that's biblical, then go and read the Psalms again. Because in so many different situations in the Psalms, the psalmists will cry out to God. They'll say, this is awful, this is awful. And sometimes you get like 50, 60 verses of this is awful, this is awful. And then just maybe near the end somewhere it goes, but God, but God, invite God into your pain. The next thing that Hannah did was that she let God work in her. And in that, she was able to give birth to the prophetic. 
She literally allowed God to put a seed within her that then released the prophetic. She gave birth to Samuel, who at a time when the word of God was scarce, Samuel became a prophet. And Samuel was the one who spoke into the nation. He was the one who anointed Saul. He anointed David. And actually, um, he, he, he transformed that whole spiritual situation. But what I'd like to say is, it wasn't just Samuel. But actually, that was something that was sown into Hannah that then she imparted and passed on when she had Samuel. So question for you. Panina, the ham and cheese Panina that we were talking about earlier on. Panina, Elkanah's other wife. Can you tell me, okay, write it on the live stream. Can you tell me the names of Panina's kids? Okay, don't bother because we don't know them, okay? She had lots of kids, but actually it was Samuel who had two books that were named after him in the Old Testament. It was Samuel who was the guy who changed the course of the nation. And so what Hannah did was she allowed God to work in her and out of that difficult, difficult situation, out of that dark situation, the prophetic was released and there was a newness in that nation. The word of God was really, really being heard. The word of God was triumphant at that point, at a point where it hadn't been for so long. And the next thing she does is she lets her pain bring her to a point of greater surrender. She lets her pain bring her to a point of greater surrender to God. And my testimony, as many of yours will be, is that often in the darkest, darkest times, when we get hold of Jesus, we feel his closeness greater than ever before. And actually we see him do something supernatural, prophetic and wonderful, but it doesn't feel very good at the time. It's tough, day in, day out. And Ian um, mentioned this a few weeks ago, um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit more of the story of um, us and, and uh, having children. Um, well, I, I met Ian, well, we started going out just shortly after my 30th birthday. And um, we went out for about six weeks and then we got engaged and we were married within nine months. Now, you know, you'll know from the... The, from the story that I'm about to tell you, nine months was not significant. But obviously that was quite a short time to be courting. Courting, that's very quaint, isn't it? Um, so we decided that we wouldn't try to have kids straight away. So after about 18 months, we started trying to have children. And a couple of years later, uh, we still hadn't had children. Um, around then, I um, fell pregnant and um, had a miscarriage. Um, in the next couple of years, then I fell pregnant again. We had another miscarriage. And around that time, God moved us up to Loughton. And within about four months of being in Loughton, I found out I was pregnant again. I was thinking, this is it, you know. And God had given us so many promises about um, children and about um, digging wells and things like that. And the third well was okay. And then six weeks later, I started bleeding and um, quite heavily and I thought here we go again I'm gonna lose this one and we loads of people were praying and uh, I just literally sat on the sofa and asked people to peel me grapes and and didn't move in the hope that we could you know this wasn't going to happen again and we'd also had prophetic words over our first child being a child of breakthrough and our breakthrough child was Emma. She made it through. And uh, as you know, she's um, a wonderful testimony of God's faithfulness. Her middle name is actually Faith. And that was because we believe that uh, um, it, through our faith, we held on God's faithfulness to us. And he gave us Emma. And then we had the blessing two years later, just less than two years later, um, the double blessing having Abby as well. And so that's our story. And isn't that wonderful? It had a happy ending. That's great. But you know what? There was day in, day out, month in, month out, 
There was holding on to God in, a th in that, sometimes screaming and kicking. That was Ian, not me, obviously. But sometimes just so desperate. And that hope deferred, making my heart feel sick. It was tough. It was really tough. But the toughest thing about it was that I couldn't fix it. I'm a fixer. You tell me something about something and, uh, you know, if it needs sorting, whatever, my brain's already going. And how can we fix this? How can we sort this out? But do you know what? I could not fix that. And when we come to that point where we can't fix it, we can't do it, we can't sort it, even in the darkest of times, that's the point when as we surrender ourselves afresh to God and just say, I can't do this. That's the point at which then he can step in and transform the situation. And that's what he did for Hannah. So she's brought her in a pain and she's processed it with God. She's let God work in her and sow that seed that the prophetic could be released. She's um, let her pain bring her, her to that point of greater surrender. And then finally what she does is she worships. She worships. And the wonderful thing about when Hannah's worshipping is that actually she's, she's worshipping, she's praising God, but she's not saying, thank you, God, for my son. Thank you, God, for my son. She's worshipping and thanking God for who he is. And she is actually, it's a prophetic song, speaking a lot of the stuff that said then Samuel, as the prophet, will then speak over and into the nation in time to come. So those are the things that Hannah did. Someone said to me at the beginning of lockdown, so what's the dream? What's the dream? By the end of lockdown, what do you want um, God to do? What does that look like? And I said to them, I want to be in a church that is missional. I want people to know that we are all on mission. It's been my phrase for many, many years. We don't believe in missionaries. And that is not dissing people who give up their homes and go abroad at all. But it's just that sense of, you know, you don't need a title. We are all followers of Jesus. We are all lovers of Jesus. Let's just tell other people about it. And so my dream is to have a church that's on mission, mission-minded people, people who want to, in a dark and a very dismal climate, to speak the word of the Lord into different situations. And, you know, that doesn't have to be, you know, standing on a soapbox on the corner of the road and shouting at people and, you know, Bible bashing and all the rest of it. That can be as simple as just, I was going to say, giving someone a smile in the supermarket. You have to make it go to your eyes these days, otherwise they won't see it. But just that, that a word of, of kindness, a word in season, just hearing from God. Maybe you should just send someone a text or, or whatever. It can be as little as that. But actually, I want to be in a church. I want Restore to be a church that is mission-minded, that it sees each one of us see ourselves as being on mission. And, you know, I'm not putting down the fact there are some people I know and you found lockdown really, really hard. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let you off the hook, but I get that. And I just sense that what God's saying is, what's the next step? Take the next step. It can be as small as a smile, as writing someone a little word of encouragement of whatever it is, or it can be a full-blown prophetic word. And I also want us to be a church that is exhibiting the spiritual gifts. You know, just before lockdown, um, Ian and um, a group of people, the, the Finneys and Wren, um, Katie Nicholson from EFCC went to Hong Kong and they spent some time with Jackie Pullinger and they came back and there was kind of like a fire in their bones um, and it felt familiar to me 
but it feels like it's something that maybe up until then we'd lost a bit and we don't want to lose that during lockdown. We want to be people who are people of the spirit of God. We want to be those people who are exhibiting the spiritual gifts, not to show off, but because we have a nation. We have a world at the moment that desperately, desperately needs Jesus. And, and they need us to be in that place, even in that place of where we feel barren, of where we feel it's too hard, where we feel it's really difficult, just allowing God to put his seed within us and then for us to release out to our families, to our friends, to the people that we meet in the street. Maybe we need to be taking a step literally and walking around our neighbourhoods and praying and praying blessing on them. We could do that as families, you know. Families can walk around and chat. You can walk to the park and you can um, have a uh, chat to Jesus and tell him how much you'd love your friends to come to know Jesus. That's my dream. But we're living in the not quite yet. One of my specific dreams is something called early intervention in schools. And that's something we're going to set a team up to do. And uh, it's, it's mentoring children in primary schools. And um, that's something that you could join me in. But do you know what? I can't do that yet. The schools aren't even back. We haven't got people trained. It's tricky at the moment. I'm living in the not quite yet. But what is it that God laid on your heart? Maybe at the beginning of the year, maybe the beginning of lockdown, or maybe he hasn't yet and you just need to take that time this week and listen to him. What is it that God is laying on your heart? What's the dream? God's dream. And you need to take hold of that. I need to take hold of that. We're living in the not quite yet. But in South African terms... It's not going to be long before it's no longer just now, but it's now, now, or even maybe now, now, now. Let's get ready for that. Let's get ready and step into it. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, it says of Samuel that the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognised that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. It was a dark and a barren time across the nation and for Hannah herself, personally. But into that, Samuel came, and the word of the Lord was spread all across the nation. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presence, for your goodness, for your peace. And Father, I particularly want to pray for people this morning who are feeling in that place of barrenness, whether that is a physical barrenness or whether it's a, uh, just that they don't feel like, uh, maybe they don't even know where you are in all of this. Holy Spirit, would you come right now? Would you sow that seed of hope into lives that are feeling desperate right now? Would you sow, Lord Jesus, your Holy Spirit into each of our lives so that we would know, we would know, Lord, that hope being restored that is a fountain of life. And Father, I do want to specifically pray for those people who are trying to have children and are finding that really difficult. And Father, I pray for loads and loads of grace, but we also pray for a supernatural fruitfulness for them. And Father, I pray for those people who are in financial difficulty, difficulty right now. I pray that you would release fruitfulness in their finances. Father, I pray for those who are struggling with their mental health and well-being at the moment. I pray for fruitfulness and for good mental health and well-being. And Lord, I just say, Lord... Would you take each one of us, take us afresh and release the prophetic through our lives. We want to be an army of people who go into the world and say, hey, we love Jesus. Wouldn't you love to love him too? Amen.